I met John Siegenthaler in 1992. I was 28 years old, and I had just published my first novel, The Patron Saint of Liars, and he invited me to come on A Word on Words. And it was the beginning of a long and beautiful friendship. John was such a supporter of literature, such a supporter of everything, Nashville, the country, all that is good in the world. But when I think of him, what I really remember is he is the person who always made me laugh. He made me laugh before we went on television. He made me laugh on television. He was the person that I was always happiest to run into at a party, at a restaurant. He had this way when I saw him of always making me feel like I was the person in the whole world he was most hoping to see. And I have to say, he was the person in the whole world that I was most hoping to see. John, I love you. Thank you for everything you did for Nashville. Hi, I'm Alice Randall, and like everybody else talking to you today, I was a friend of John Sigenthaler's. I'm 55 years old, and I first made his friendship when I was 25 years old. For 30 years, he was a mentor to me. He was a man who understood the importance of words on paper and words on air. He shepherded me through getting into print, but that's not what I'm here to talk to you about. He used to call me babe, hey babe, as I think he called a lot of people. But what I want to say, having been on his show four different times, as much as he loved all of the authors that he had, as many great friends as he had, that what John would want me to say today is he loved nobody as much as Dolores and John Michael and Jack. And as his dear friend of 30 years, as he sat with me through two husbands, a uh, $10 million lawsuit, the last words he want me to say about him, of all the words that he knew, his most favorite words were the ones he used to praise Jack and to say to Dolores, I love you. So John's looking down in heaven, I hope, and here with us today, but I had to say that, that of all these books, nothing was more important to him than his immediate family. And this is a man who did extraordinary things. I always felt that when John Siegenthaler entered the room, civilization entered too. You felt a certain kind of raised standard. It came with his conversational elegance, his sparkling, often playful intelligence. It even came in the splendid way he always dressed. John invited me to be on his book show twice. The first time in 1994 for my debut novel, Land of Goshen, he interviewed a wild-eyed novelist who could barely stay in the camera frame. He was so excited to be published. The second time for my second novel, Pickett's Charge, John interviewed a more mature and maybe more cynical Charles McNair. This was in 2014, 20 years later, a two-decade span between my novels. On both occasions, I felt a little in awe of John's trademark critical skills. He asked sharp, revealing questions. He held a sure grasp of the characters and plot. He had insight to the intentions of the author. In these interviews, I saw that John, whether in his 60s or his 80s, would never be a host to simply phone it in. He read both my books. He read everybody's books. He took his precious time to research and know his guests. Why? Simple. To John, books and writers mattered. So did he. I like to think of John Siegenthaler as a lighthouse keeper. He blazed night and day with a passion for books. His bright light gave so many of us, hundreds of writers through the years, a safe place to land with our words with our dreams. Thank you, John. I, for one, will pass it on. We've lost a great man, a Nashville legend, one of the classiest, smartest, most interesting men I've ever had the pleasure to know. John was a catalyst for me. He was my first big interview when my debut novel came out in 2007. My publicist had me slated to appear on a word on words. This was to be my first major televised interview, and I was simultaneously scared to death and thrilled that I was about to enter the annals of the show's history to sit down and talk with the John Sigenthaler. Most authors will tell you, many interviewers don't read the books, 
They have talking points and synopses sent by publicists, and they rely on a few well-placed questions to guide the discussion. Uh. That was not John Sigenthaler. He read the book. He read all the books. When he sat down before the cameras rolled, he opened the back cover and I saw three pages of notes. He refreshed his memory while I panicked. Then the cameras rolled and we began. Saying he'd read the book is a misnomer. He dissected it. Had gone so in depth, as a matter of fact, that he asked me questions I had no answers for in ways I'd never thought about, about parts of the book I didn't even realize were there. He drew every exquisite inch out of that interview, peppering me with interrogatories and asides about his own life as a crime reporter, diving into the relationships between the police and the FBI, the poems, the killer, the whys behind the story, my process. Our meetings became more personal after that. I'd always wear my pearls in his honor. He'd always wear a tie. When he told me about the cancer, I wanted to weep, but he kept a brave face on, and so did I. Every time we parted, he gave me a hug and a kiss, because it might be the last time. He was hyper aware of his own mortality, telling me his age with a sly sense of pride. After one interview, he plainly stated he was wondering about his legacy, and that he feared this would be our last interview. It was. He wasn't kidding. And I gave him the only answer I could. John, you were unforgettable. But he is. Bob Dylan once said of uh, Johnny Cash, he said, you know, he, he referred to him as the North Star. And when I think about John Siegenthaler, he was always the North Star to me around here. Every time I would make a career move or anything that I wanted to do in my life that, that took a little different turn, to go down a different trail, I found myself in the presence of John. And I know half the time he didn't know what I was talking about, but there was just something about John just here as a, as a sounding board and as that presence and that world-class entity that uh, he always let me talk my, my own self down my own roads and give my own self my own answers, and he would gently bring it along. And he was such a wonderful presence. Uh, Nashville is such a unique place. You know, it's a star-making town. And every Monday morning, it seems like we make a new star around here. The word legend gets thrown around a lot in Nashville, icon, those kind of things. And those are, those are not terms that are in short supply, but the term statesman, you don't hear that much these days, period. Not just in Nashville, but period. A man that was born to be a statesman, called to be a statesman, lived his life as a statesman, and to leave so much behind. The old proverb about when a man passes away, a library burns to the ground. Well, so it is with Mr. Siegenthaler. However, John left such a wonderful library for all of us to feast on for the rest of our life. He was a wonderful statesman. He was my friend. I loved him very much. And Connie and I send our deepest love to Dolores and the boys and the grandkids, the Siegenthalers. As many conversations as I had with John Sigenthaler about books and literature and politics, they aren't my main memory of him. My main memory is something that I don't know if other people experienced or not. I, I'm probably twice John's size. Uh, big, I'm a big guy, and uh, I'm used to being with jocks and used to being with military guys who hug and slap. When I would be with John, the thing that struck me most was the way he would slap my back with this explosive slap. Uh, it was affection, it was fatherly, it was warm, but I was unprepared for how strong it was. And it would bring to mind the physicality of his life, something you don't normally think of in a journalist or an editor or a man who lives the literary life. But it would bring back to mind the young reporter rescuing a man about to jump off a bridge or uh, a Kennedy administration official taking a beating in Alabama uh, when the Freedom Riders were there. And there was something about his physicality that came through that welcoming, friendly, jocular slap that was so, so strong and so warm and so affectionate. And it made me remember the other side of John Sigenthaler, not just the man of television, the man of law, the man of books, the man of the written page, but 
but the physicality of the man that I think was something that we was always there, that we always knew, but sometimes we missed because of the other things we were discussing with him. But I have a I have a distinct muscle memory of John Sigenthaler's slap on my back, and I'll I'll never lose that. I first met John Sigenthaler at a photo session in which the photographer thought it would be an interesting photograph to have us stand just nearly nose to nose with each other. John was a little bit shorter than I, and, and as we stood there, you know, he was sort of gritting his teeth. He wasn't too happy about it, nor was I. But he said, well, this is a good way to get to know each other. We sure won't forget each other. And... Uh, I was delighted to be standing that close to him, actually, and uh, because I knew what a great man he was. I knew that, you know, he was editor of the Tennessean in its golden days, and that he had, you know, done so much uh, activist work, you know, for the civil rights movement and, and First Amendment rights. So I admired the man, and then later on when he called uh, wanting to get me on his show to talk about my memoir, Chinaberry Sidewalks. Um, I was delighted to be on it. And, and before the cameras rolled, we sat and we talked for a while, and it started, it hit me. I said, this man is kind. And the thing, and it, the interview, he just, he put me so at ease for the interview. And the whole time I'm thinking, you know, I'm, uh, this is a kind man talking to me. Very complimentary about my book, but his just innate kindness is is what I'm drawn to, and and what I took away with me. And and after that interview, you know, we had lunch together a couple of times, and and I never got very far away from this great admiration and actually love for the man because of that really deep kindness that he had. And I was saddened to know that he'd left us, but, you know, I have a little piece of him to carry with me where I go, and it, it's, it's always great to have someone who you want to emulate a little bit, and I certainly want to emulate John Sigenthaler. So, I had the pleasure of being on a, uh, on a Word on Word several times, but the first time I was on the show, uh, I was in makeup with John, and he asked me to sign uh, a copy of my novel, Mr. Peanut. And I went to sign the book, and he had notes, extensive notes, all through the book. Um, this was incredible to me because I asked him what he'd been doing that day, and he said he'd already shot five different episodes of A Word on Words. So I asked him who he'd spoken to that day, and he mentioned the authors, and I looked at the other books, and they had the same uh, level of uh, exhaustive note-taking and care and uh, just intense close reading. And when I think of John, that's what I think of. He brought so much passion, so much attention to this job, to these conversations. And that came through when you talked to him as an author. He made you feel as if you'd written the most important book in America. And uh, it came through in everything else he did as a person. and. Uh, I'll never forget that about him. And I think that I come away from my time with him just hoping that I would bring that same level of solicitude and passion and energy to whatever I end up doing in the future. It was May 1961, well over half a century ago now, when the decision was made. John Siegenthaler was the administrative assistant to the Attorney General of the United States, Robert Kennedy, and there was trouble, significant trouble, in Siegenthaler's native South. The Freedom Riders, civil rights activists protesting segregated interstate travel, 
had been stopped and beaten in Anniston, Alabama. Now the action was moving to Birmingham and to Montgomery. Kennedy and his brother, the President of the United States, needed to send someone to help. Well, who have we got, John Kennedy asked. Bobby Kennedy's reply was succinct and momentous. John's here. He can go. And so Siegenthaler went. His credentials? A native of Nashville, Siegenthaler was garrulous, engaging, and indisputably a son of the South. He recalled that, I'd go in, my southern accent dripping sorghum and molasses, and warm them up. In theory, his task was to work with the Alabama authorities to get the Freedom Riders to safety. In reality, once there, he saw a woman being attacked outside the Montgomery bus station and tried to intervene. The next thing he knew, he had been beaten by a white demonstrator brandishing a piece of pipe. His skull fractured, the personal representative of the President of the United States and of the Attorney General lay on the pavement for half an hour. He may have been on the ground, but in a larger sense, John Siegenthaler had stood up, stood up for the right over the wrong, for justice over injustice. As a reporter, as an aide and advisor to Robert Kennedy, as editor and publisher of the Tennessean newspaper, and as an advocate for literature and for culture, Siegenthaler was courageous and canny, fearless and tireless. He embodied the best journalism could be, calling them as he saw them, but he also understood that much of life unfolds in the twilight. It was an insight that led him to be at once tough and generous. Raised a Roman Catholic, John approached the world with a Catholic sense of tragedy and of possibility. He knew the world was fallen, but believed deeply in redemption, in progress, and in the duty of every soul to try to make the world at least a little better. He understood the injunction that to whom much is given, much is expected, and grateful for his own life, he held himself to account. John adored the arena of public life. He helped carry Robert Kennedy to his grave, was the first to suggest that a young Albert Gore Jr. run for a House seat, and he remained a thoughtful, unapologetic voice for liberal causes in a region whose politics ran ever redder in the 21st century. He never slowed down keeping up a formidable speaking and charitable schedule until the end. And John loved it all. There will be many moments in the coming years when those of us in Nashville and beyond will wish that we, like the Kennedys in an hour of crisis, could once more send John Siegenthaler into the fray to seek the truth and protect the powerless, all with that melodious accent and an inescapable sense of the joy of the fight.